to have uh, uh, Jesse Thorner, who is now at the University of Illinois here today. Um, and he's going to speak, be speaking to us today about an approximate form of Arden's holomorphic conjecture and non-vanishing of Arden L functions. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me. It's good to, it's good to see everybody. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about today is joint with Robert Lemke Oliver at Tufts and Asif Zaman at University of Toronto. Um, this is something that we started thinking about, I think it was just at the beginning of COVID and we finished everything up um, just uh, last month. And um, I, I find this work to be pretty exciting to share it with you. So we're going to be um, talking about uh, Arten's holomorphy conjecture and non-vanishing of Arten L functions. But the Arten L function that I'm going to focus on most is the Dedekind zeta function of a number field divided by Riemann zeta. So um, what we're going to talk about at the beginning, I'm going to fix a group G. It's going to be our Galois group for a family of fields. Uh, these fields are going to be denoted by K. Um, the discriminant over Q is going to be denoted DK. Dedekind zeta for the field will be zeta K and Riemann zeta as usual will be uh, zeta S. And I'm going to denote my family of fields, um, my family of Galois extensions, uh, FG of Q. Um, uh, this is going to be the set of normal extensions of Q uh, with Galois group G and discriminant going up to Q. So this is a collection of fields that I'm wanting to average over. And uh, a very beautiful result due to Armada and Brouwer tells us that if I have a Galois extension K over F, then uh, zeta K over zeta F is going to be entire. This is predicted to be the case for non-Galois extensions as well. And that is a very hard open question. Um, this is uh, this is an immediate consequence of the Artin conjecture, but um, but that but this is wide open, and of course uh, we all believe, or we all should believe at least, the generalized Riemann hypothesis that um, remember uh, this Galois extension. Uh, um, well, these fields K, I'm assuming that they're normal over Q. So the ratio zeta k over zeta is assumed to is, is now uh, assumed to be holomorphic, and we expect that it's non-vanishing for real part of s bigger than a half. Okay, so this is uh, what we would like to be the case, and this is sort of what we're going to be striving for, showing that in some average sense, uh, a result along these lines might be true, because. Point-wise, for, for an individual extension k over q, um, we just do not have very much to go off of. The best result we have in this direction is due to Ligarius and Blitzko, um, generalizing what we know to be true for Dirichlet L functions, a uh, very classical setting, uh, the setting of primes and arithmetic progressions, um, apart from a single simple real zero that might be ridiculously close to s equals one. We have that the ratio of Dedekind zeta functions here is non-vanishing in this very, very tiny region, right? If you notice as the, uh, as the discriminant or as the imaginary part of s tends to infinity, right? This is sort of approaching real part of s equals one with the boundary of the critical strip for, for these Dedekind zeta functions. And this zero free region is good enough for some things, but in most applications that one could ever hope to think of, this is a very, very poor and inadequate zero free region. Um, but basically, if you, if you care about field uniformity, which we do very much, uh, this is basically the best that one can do, and it's using techniques that were developed last century. I'm sorry, it's two, I'm sorry, uh, two centuries ago. So um, how might we seek to get an improvement over this? Well, 
kind of a mantra within analytic number theory, if you don't like your pointwise bound, you average. And so we would like to be able to average over number fields K and show that Dedekind zeta for K divided by Riemann zeta on average has a much better zero free region than what the standard techniques can prove for an individual field. However, uh, averaging over number fields is a very uh, exotic average to execute and you encounter a number of problems. So here's the first problem. And it actually comes from something that we like. It's the Aramata, Aramata Brouwer theorem combined with some Galois theory. So um, as a consequence of the Aramata Brouwer theorem, if F is a subfield of my Galois extension K over Q, right? Then if the Dedekind zeta for F has a zero, then so too does Dedekind zeta for K, right? Because this is gonna be a Galois extension. And so um, if zeta K over zeta F is holomorphic, right? Then that means that the zeros cancel out perfectly. And so a zero for zeta F is a zero for zeta K. And now what might be the case? It might be the case that many fields K in our family of normal extensions might share a fixed subfield F naught. And what could happen? Um, this fixed field F naught, or when I say fixed, I, I don't mean like fixed by a group. I mean like um, it is a given field that is not varying in any way. Uh, this, this given field F naught might have a really bad zero close to the edge of the critical strip, very grossly violating the Riemann hypothesis. And then that zero, that one bad zero would propagate upward to many or potentially many fields K. That's really, really bad. That completely messes up the average. And so what we need to do is we need to be able to average over K and rule this out, right? And overall, this is a very, very hard problem and there's not much in the way of progress on this. So th th this is a very, very tough problem. The second problem that we encounter is that in the process of averaging, we encounter something called a large sieve. Um, we're looking at, um, we're looking at a, a family of normal extensions, which means we're looking at a family of Galois groups. And essentially what's happening is in order to execute this average, we're needing to basically look at um, some sort of an L2 average given to us by something called a large sieve. And that's going to give rise to the study of um, uh, more complicated L functions that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, so right now, um, we believe, and this would follow immediately from a strong version of the Artin conjecture, that zeta k over zeta, well, that should be the L function of some cuspidal automorphic representation on some, uh, on, on some general linear group, uh, vastly generalizing um, uh, traditional results in the theory of modular forms. Um, so basically, the, this, should be, this should be some high rank cusp form. But we have no idea whether that's the case. This is wide open except for in a handful of situations. And because of this, uh, it's not as though we could execute an average using something kind of like, uh, kind of like the Pedersen trace formula or the Kuznetsov trace formula. That's just not available to us. Those are relying on automorphic properties that we just don't have. And so to give you an idea of um, what's happening here, uh, you can think of zeta k over zeta as being the L function associated to the uh, regular representation of our Galois group, uh, taking away the trivial component. That's like the dividing by Riemann zeta part. And so uh, zeta k over zeta uh, is going to be uh, this representation, which I'm denoting by psi k. And so because like trace formula methods are not going to be able to work for us, we need to work with uh, what's called the dual version of the large sieve. And that means that we have to look at the analytic properties of 
uh, cipher one field twisted by cipher another field. So this is a tensor product of two representations. And um, uh, as a general principle, you would think that these things are going to be uh, reasonable representations that lie in, um, say, uh, the representations of like G cross G, for instance. That's what you would like. But that's not known in, in general. And because we don't know much in the way of uh, automorphy properties, we have no idea whether these L functions are reasonably well behaved in the general case, right? And in particular, um, what should be the case is that like if K1 equals K2, this should have like a pole of some, of, of some reasonable order at S equals one. And this is, a, this is just very hard to, um, to handle. And so the conjecture of Artin uh, in a very special case would tell us that these L functions are in fact entire, uh, except, when, um, except when K1 equals K2, and then you would have a pole at S equals one. Um, but we don't have the Artin conjecture. We would like to prove things as unconditionally as possible. So these two problems are going to haunt us for the rest of the talk. Um, so uh, before I get into the work uh, with, Le with Robert Lemke Oliver and Asif Zalman, I'm first gonna talk about some preliminary work that I did with Asif. So uh, what we did was um, we, we looked at this problem of averaging over number fields and trying to get a good handle on the zero distribution. Um, we, we thought about this pretty carefully. And so we, um, we came to the following conclusion. So I'm gonna define the intersection multiplicity MG of Q to be the max over K1 in our family of the number of K2 in our family such that the intersection of K1 and K2 is not the rationals. And essentially why we're doing this is because in this situation, uh, the Galois group of the compositum of K1 and K2 is G cross G. When, when the intersection equals Q. When it doesn't equal Q, you do not have this nice property. And I'm going to define by NK of sigma T, this is going to be the number of zeros of um, our psi K function. This is like Dedekind zeta divided by Riemann zeta. The number of zeros to the right of sigma up to height t. So if you were to say, believe the Riemann hypothesis, then for any t bigger than zero and any, actually for any t bigger than or equal to zero and any sigma bigger than a half, nk of sigma t would be zero. nk of sigma t is like counting counterexamples to Riemann hypothesis. And so what Asif and I showed is that when you sum nk of sigma t over all k in our family, you get the intersection multiplicity times qt to a power, which is decreasing as sigma gets closer to the one line. Remember, like in the prime number theorem, the zeros of L functions closer to the one line, uh, closest to the one line are the most damaging. And this is saying that as you get closer and closer to the one line, the um, proportion of zeros that you encounter is, is vanishing. And uh, basically by, um, by uh, trivial consequence of this estimate, what we can say is that for all except uh, intersection multiplicity times Q to the epsilon of these, L, uh, of these fields, zeta K over zeta is non-zero provided that real part of S is at least um, uh, one minus epsilon over a hundred times the order of the group and imaginary parts going up to some height. That's reasonably large. And so the point here is that in most applications, even getting up to height like discriminant or even log discriminant is considered like a good height and you want a wide region. So the real part of S, you want that to be as close to the half line as possible. And even something like this is brand new. Um, uh, wide zero free regions like this uh, even even up to small height are very hard to come by. 
Um, I should note that uh, a few years ago, there was some very beautiful work by Lillian Pierce, Caroline Turnage Butterbaugh, and uh, Melanie Wood, wherein they proved a result like this uh, with two changes. One, they needed to assume the Artin conjecture that, that um, Art and L functions are holomorphic and indeed automorphic. And they also uh, did not handle um, the field, the, the intersection multiplicity that we have here. Like they had something that was maybe uh, a bit, um, uh, so something that, that maybe was not quite as clean, but, but in, in principle, it's basically the same thing that's happening here. One of the things that, that um, came of this work with Asif is that we could cleanly uh, show that this intersection multiplicity here just kind of pops out nicely. Um, and so like, what is this telling us? Well, um, this is telling us that as long as you can control the intersection multiplicity, as long as it's like not too big, like maybe it's a relatively small power of Q and you also have some sort of like a polynomial lower bound on the size of the family, then, um, then you can say that, that in, in, in a reasonable sense, almost all of these ratios, like in a, like a density, um, all except the density zero subset of these ratios have a very, very strong zero free region, like commensurate with Riemann hypothesis uh, up to the quality of this part right here. Obviously, we expect this to be anything, um, anything less than a half. Oh, by the way, I wanted to put a plug in. Um, Jesse, you mentioned Lillian Pierce. Um, just for those interested, she'll be giving the colloquium at Vanderbilt tomorrow. Excellent. Um, so it'll dovetail well with what you're talking about today. Yeah, um, yeah, she, she, she's an amazing speaker. Okay, so, so we've got this. And well, how does one go about proving this? Um, oh, sorry, that was, that was what I was looking for. Okay, so how does one go about proving this? Uh, I'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, but um, before that, I'd like to talk about an implication for art and L functions. And this is gonna kind of go into what I'm uh, going to talk about in my work with um, or in, in a, uh, my work with both Asif and Robert. So psi, not psi k anymore, but but psi, which could possibly equal psi k, I'm going to take that to be some uh, possibly complex irreducible representation of G. Uh, it's a theorem of Artin that if you're away from the critical strip, then we have a factorization of zeta k as a, as a product uh, of L functions associated to the complex irreducible representations of G, the trivial representation that's corresponding to Riemann zeta. For all other representations, there's some Artin L function LS psi, and uh, you raise that to the power given by the dimension of psi, and you take the product of all these and you get Riemann zeta. It's kind, you can think of this as being um, kind of like a spectral decomposition of, of zeta k. Kind of like for a, for a cyclotomic extension of the rationals, it's Dedekind zeta function factors as a product of Dirichlet L functions. So uh, a weak form of the Artin conjecture is that if psi is non-trivial, then LSI is entire. We mentioned this a little while back. A very beautiful theorem due to Brouwer, which is uh, it's kind of a, a wonder in character theory, is that what you can do is you can express LSI as a product of, um, of L functions associated to characters of cyclic subgroups. And so uh, these C chi of uh, the, the C psi of chi's that are coming up in the exponent over here, they're rational. And you can prove a bit more than this um, in certain situations. And the point here is that if you have a zero free region for LS chi, 
then that gives you a zero free region for LS psi. Okay. And actually what you can do is you, you, you can basically express psi itself, the, the, the character psi as, um, as a linear combination of the characters of, uh, as a linear combination of inductions of the characters chi scaled by these uh, scaled by these exponents. And then as a trivial consequence of that expression, you get this factorization. Okay. So as a, um, uh, as a corollary of this, uh, because uh, we are capable of expressing um, well, with with a little bit of work, we're capable of expressing um, zeta k over zeta in terms of characters of cyclic groups. There, there exists a decomposition of that sort using class field theory. And so what we can do is we can express the zeta k over zeta in terms of the characters of cyclic groups. And if you have a zero free region for zeta k over zeta, that's going to translate to a zero free region for the characters of these cyclic groups. And then by Brouwer's theorem, that trickles down to a zero free region for these art and L functions. But also, not only is it a region of um, not only is it a, a region of uh, non-vanishing, it's also also a region of holomorphy. And so if we knew, for instance, that um, uh, the Riemann hypothesis for true for zeta k over zeta, then we would have both holomorphy and non-vanishing to the right of the half line for all of these art and L functions. And so what happens is our zero free region trickles down into this setting, right? So we got a zero free region for zeta k over zeta on average. And our point here is that um, is that, that zero free region is going to trickle down to the Artin L factors. This is going to get a lot tougher in a moment because uh, right, this multiplicity here is something that we don't really have a good grasp on in general. But more on that later. So uh, how does one go about proving this um, this uh, zero free region on average, this zero density estimate. Well, the first thing that you do is you try to detect, you try to detect zeros of a given LS psi k. And how do you do that? Well, it would be um, well. So 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 what happens is you take LS psi k, and as as a general principle, right. Uh, the zeros of LSIK, right, they're, they're numerous. You can quantify that very explicitly. And uh, especially when you try to, uh, when you try to understand zeros uh, near the half line, right, like these, these zeros are very frequent. And um, because of that, LSIK is actually highly oscillatory. And so what you would like to do is somehow mollify these oscillations using uh, by basically detecting zeros of LSIK times some function that mimics one over LSIK. So the best function to mimic LS, uh, to, the best function to mimic one divided by LSIK is, well, one over LSIK. However, there's a problem when you multiply L by its reciprocal, you don't have zeros, you get like one. So what do you do? You take one over LSIK, which is going to be some Dirichlet series, and you truncate it at a convenient point. And when you look at that truncation, right, when you encounter a zero of LS, one over LS is going to be large. And so correspondingly, if you truncate the Dirichlet, if you truncate the Dirichlet series at a convenient point, then um, then the truncated Dirichlet series, I'm going to call that a Dirichlet polynomial, for 1 over LS, that's going to be large. And basically what you want to do is you uh, want to study uh, this Dirichlet polynomial near a zero, and uh, we can quantify in a very particular sense that near a zero, these Dirichlet polynomials will be large. This is a very classical pursuit. 
It's something that people say for Dirichlet characters for a really long time, and we're just kind of upping the ante a little bit. Here's the tricky part. Um, we want to show that no individual field K uh, can have an LSI K that has too many zeros. And what do we mean by that? We want to take this Dirichlet polynomial up to height t and think about an L2 average. So like integrating, um, in, integrating in, uh, in the t aspect, right? This Dirichlet polynomial is going to be like sum of a of n over n to the s, s equaling like something kind of like 1 plus i t. And you average in the t aspect. And what you would like to do is basically show that in an average sense, these Dirichlet polynomials can't be too large. That involves something called a large sieve. And if you can prove this large sieve, then no, no L2 average of these Dirichlet polynomials can be too large. So you can detect zeros by having the Dirichlet polynomial be large, but it can't be large too often in aggregate over uh, all the fields K in our family. So the tough part is to prove this large sieve with no help coming from automorphy. And we need to account for this field intersection multiplicity, which could be large. We don't know. And also as a general principle, we don't know whether the family uh, FG of Q, like that family could be small. And so if the size of the family is somehow like small relative to the multiplicity, well, that could be problematic and we can't rule it out. So um, here is an example of a large sieve. So if X is larger than a certain polynomial in Q and A is any function from the integers to the complex numbers, then we have uh, this mean value theorem. And so the thing to weigh this against is Cauchy-Schwarz. So if you were to um, put this up against Cauchy-Schwarz, then what happens is basically uh, on uh, uh, basically you have this um, you have this L two norm for the A sequence, and if Cauchy-Schwarz were how you were to estimate this. Well, then basically the multiplicity would go away, the log x's would go away, and you would multiply by the size of the full family. So that's not very good at all. And so this savings that we get relative to Cauchy Schwartz is decisive. And uh, indeed, one of, the, um, one of the things I've been thinking about with Asif for a long time is how to prove results like this in a much broader context beyond uh, ratios of Dedekind zeta functions. And we can, we can prove something like this in, uh, in very great generality. But typically, um, this mg of q is going to be like 1 in, in these more general settings. And this is one of the difficulties here. It's making sure that we can capture this field intersection multiplicity, right? Because this is sort of what's governing uh, the problem at the beginning that I talked about with this Armada Brower business, um, where a field, where, where a field who's uh, uh, um, you have several k perhaps sharing a given subfield, and a bad zero from the bottom field might propagate upward to all the top fields. We're encapsulating that using this intersection multiplicity. And so this is key. That's like the most important part about this. All right. So a little bit of how one does this. So um, essentially what you can do is you can think of the left-hand side here as being an operator norm of some, of some matrix. And we're basically using uh, the fact that um, the operator norm of a matrix equals the operator norm of the dual matrix. And that leads us to this switching of the averages. So we now have a function B 
uh, going from our family of fields to the complex numbers. And we've got these BKs floating around. And now I've switched my averages. And I have, an, I have the sum over k here as opposed to a sum over n. So the fact that I can switch these averages is, uh, is the whole reason why this works. Um, if I couldn't do that, then I would have no idea how to prove this without assuming some sort of automorphy result, in which case you could use a trace formula. So you expand the square and you swap the order of summation. And in doing so, uh, you, um, you are led to trying to understand sums of these characters. So how does one go about doing, uh, does, how does one go about estimating this red sum? Well, we have two cases. Case one is when the intersection of K1 and K2 is not the rationals. In that case, um, it's straightforward to show that this product is bounded by some sort of a divisor function. So it's pretty well behaved. And we understand the divisor function on average pretty well. So we get something like this. And now we just need to, so this is like a completely trivial bound. So if you're gonna apply the trivial bound, you should know how many times you're applying it. Because if you, if you apply it too many times, then you render the large sieve useless and you don't get that saving over Cauchy-Schwartz. So how many times did that occur? Well, that's like the whole point of the intersection multiplicity. It occurs at MG of Q many times. But we expect that multiplicity to be small in some sense. And when it's not, well, that presents a problem. So let's now look at case two where the intersection does equal Q. Well, by Galois theory, the uh, um, Galois group of the compositum is now the direct product of G with itself. And we can express uh, psi, uh, psi k1 tensor psi k2 as uh, a non-trivial uh, irrep of g cross g. And by a result of Brouwer, that tensor product L function is entire. And so because of that, we can do like usual contour integration techniques and estimate the sum in a pretty straightforward fashion. And the large sieve follows by combining these two cases and then um, we are bounding the family by uh, the traditional bound due to Schmidt. Of course, we expect that this family is much, much, much smaller. Like some polynomial in Q that's, in, that's maybe like uh, maybe like of size Q or Q to some fixed power that isn't necessarily quite so large. Okay, so that's how we prove the large sieve. And you take the large sieve plus this Dirichlet polynomial uh, that detects zeros and you combine the two of them together. And that is enough to deduce the theorem that I proved with Ossef. Now, of course, I have not addressed at all how large this intersection multiplicity might be. It could be large. What we would like to be the case is that the, um, the size of mg, you have some possibly tiny polynomial savings over the, over the whole family. So basically the, um, the number of fields that have these crazy intersections, it's like, like the probability that you encounter such an intersection should be like zero, as we would like to have. And that's what this estimate here kind of indicates to us. And if that's actually true, then our uh, strong zero free region, the, the one that Asif and I proved a while back, it's gonna hold for almost all of the fields k in our family, right? For, for these zeta k divided by Riemann zeta. And then for almost all of these fields, these zero free regions are gonna trickle down to the Artinel constituents. Of course, um, this is assuming implicitly, well, let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's think about this intersection multiplicity, right? K intersect itself is going to be not the rationals unless K is the rationals. But if K has non-trivial Galois group, K is not the rationals, right? So this intersection multiplicity, it's at least one. So what does that tell us? That tells us that we're assuming, po we're assuming polynomial growth in the field, in, in the family of fields. But in general, we, um, we don't know 
that uh, there is, in general, a polynomial lower bound. That's, not, that, that's wide open. That's like the subject of Mala's conjectures. And there are two issues. Um, well, th there's that, right? So, um, so it's not clear to us um, whether, uh, whether even the family is large enough to subsume the possibility that there are many fields that, that have these, that had these non-trivial intersections. But the other issue is that there do exist families where n g of q has the potential to be large. So let's think about a couple examples here. So if I took g to be the alternating group n on n letters with n at least five, well then if k1 does not equal k2, then uh, basically you're applying the fundamental theorem of Galois theory here. Um, the simplicity of G shows an absence of normal of, of non-trivial normal subgroups. So that trickles down to having that the intersection of K1 and K2 is in fact the rationals. So in the case that uh, uh, we're a simple group, then this intersection multiplicity is just one. This is already highly non-trivial. In this situation, um, the, the work of uh, Pierce, Turnage, Butterbaugh, and Wood was, was, was incapable of handling this um, because the Arden conjecture is not known for an. So this is already highly non-trivial. However, we would really like to get something like Sn. And with Sn taking n at least five, um, if k1 does not equal k2, then the intersection could either be the rationals or a quadratic subfield, namely the one fixed by an. And again, by applying the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, these are the two options. But uh, we have no idea how often this quadratic subfield pops up. It could be the case that many, uh, like quanti it could be the case that quantifiably many um, of these field pairs might share a quadratic subfield, like the same quadratic subfield. We can't rule that out. And because of that, um, because of that, it's not 100% clear how useful my work with Asif is without doing a crap ton of work to get some sort of a handle on this intersection multiplicity. But the point is, my work with Asif reduces the issue of like understanding zeros of Dedekind zetas on average and their Art and L constituents on average. It reduces it purely to the arithmetic problem of estimating this multiplicity. Once you have this multiplicity being small, then you get an almost all kind of result. And that's much better than what we can do for an individual field. Enter in Robert Lemke Oliver. Uh, he came to us with a, with a twist on our idea. And with our combined efforts, we were able to prove something interesting. So originally we were averaging over, uh, aver averaging over the L function zeta k over zeta. That was the original game. And that introduced this intersection multiplicity, mg of q, which is troublesome. What we're going to do now is we're going to fix a normal subgroup of g. Um, but uh, OK, so just, just to clarify, um, remember, we, could handle, we, we, we can handle the case when g is simple pretty well using the old methods. So now in the event that, and in the event that g is not simple, take a normal subgroup. The game now is to average over um, the ratios zeta k over zeta kn, where kn is the subfield of k fixed by n. By Galois theory, um, k over kn is a Galois extension. And uh, well, um, oh, it looks like I lost you. Okay, all right, you're back. Oh no, I'm I'm still here. I just have to turn my video off for a second. Gotcha. Okay, it, I lost everybody for, for for a moment. Okay, um, so so what happens? Well, we're gonna fix this um, normal subgroup of G, and we're gonna average over zeta k over zeta kn. So by the Aramada-Brouwer theorem, uh, since k over kn 
is Galois, this ratio of Dedekind zeta functions is entire. And what we can do in this setting is uh, with a bit of extra work, we can reprove the result that I got with, with Asif, but we can do it for this, ratio, for this new ratio of Dedekind zetas. And that's gonna um, yield some, some uh, very, very important ground. So the proof, um, it, it largely carries through with a bit of extra work, but we trade the intersection multiplicity that we couldn't handle earlier for this new intersection multiplicity, which now depends on our fixed group n. So this new intersection multiplicity, basically earlier, um, like, like the, the mg of q, uh, basically take g to be n, and then you recover this new intersection multiplicity. But this new one, instead of having k1 inter intersect k2 be uh, not equal to the rationals, it's now let k1 intersect k2 be not equal to the fixed subfield of um, um, the subfield of k1 fixed by n intersect the subfield of k2 fixed by n. So basically, you you work through this large sieve in the in the zero detection stuff all over again for these new L functions, and you get this new intersection multiplicity. And as I just mentioned. Um, you recover the original results when, uh, when the normal subgroup N equals the full group. So this is a very natural sort of generalization. And in this setting, um, what Robert Ossoff and I were able to establish was kind of a, another almost all zero free region result. But now, with our new multiplicity here, and again, we would like this to be small. And when you multiply that by Q to the epsilon, we expect that this is going to be um, a density zero subset of our family. Um, what we have is that this uh, ratio of Dedekind zeta functions here is non-zero in the same, in basically the same region. So, so basically what we've done here is we've traded the intersection multiplicity mg of q for this normal intersection multiplicity, this mgn of q. And instead of dividing by Riemann zeta, we divide by the subfield of k, uh, we, Dedekind zeta for the subfield of k fixed by n. Now you might ask yourself, what does this gain? My answer to that is a lot. So, in the event that G has a unique, minimal, non-trivial, normal subgroup N, uh, the technical word for this within group theory is that G is monolithic, then this normal intersection multiplicity is one. And thus, the size of our exceptional set of fields for which we can't get this good zero free region is legitimately of size q to the epsilon. So in particular, the, um, the problems that we saw earlier, they've gone away completely. So in particular, right, uh, the, the easiest example of a monolithic group is Sn when n is at least five. The unique minimal normal, uh, the, the unique minimal non trivial normal subgroup is AN. So, in the setting where Ossif and I completely failed, Robert, Ossif, and I combine to be able to get, um, to get an almost all result. And it turns out to be the case with a little bit of, uh, of a group theory and character theory. Uh, what we can show is that if P is prime and G is any transitive subgroup of SP, then G is monolithic. So um, this, this new result here is actually becoming very pertinent for lots of new families of fields that we could not handle before, right? Here, there's no Galois structure that's necessary. Um, Right, like this, because this is holding for all transitive subgroups of SP. 
as long as P is prime. So this is just like a new group theory result. And it just happens to be directly pertinent to, uh, to the work here. Unfortunately, here there's some bad news. There's a trade-off as, as always. It's unclear whether the zero free region trickles down to the art and L functions. And the reason why that's the case is um, when you know that zeta k divided by zeta kn is non-zero, well, that's going to trickle down to, um, to a zero free region for ls chi, where chi is a one-dimensional character of a subgroup of G, uh, say H, where H intersect N is not contained within the kernel of chi. Now here is, here's really where the bad news kicks in. Brouwer's theorem, which expressed uh, the Artin L factors of, um, in our decomposition of, of zeta k, right? you had to average over all of the chi's. You can't pick and choose which ones you average over. So this group theory restriction here is actually kind of rough. So the trickle down effect that happened in the earlier case, it is not at all clear that it happens here. So how do we fix this? What can we show? Well, basically what we need is a refinement of Brouwer's theorem that accommodates, uh, that basically says that, um, uh, that, that uh, the factors of this, um, of this ratio, like we want, we want to understand the factors of this ratio that are expressible in terms of the chi satisfying this property. And that's precisely what Robert, Asif and I do under a few hypotheses. Namely, we need G to be solvable, or we need um, the index of G in, of, of N and G to be a prime power. So this is now purely a group theory problem. And so in this situation, um, if we can take Psi to be uh, an irreducible representation of G, such that our um, normal subgroup, remember we're trying to cut out the, the normal sub, uh, we're trying to cut out the subfields KN, so how do we do that? We ensure that this is the case, that N is not a, sub, um, is not a subgroup of the kernel of Psi. And we, we get an analog of Brouwer's theorem, but now we have the restriction here that when, we, um, that when we're averaging over subgroups, the, um, the intersection of those subgroups with N cannot be a subgroup of the kernel of, of Chi. And so this, um, this is a very high powered group theory result that I'm not going to go into. And uh, basically you take this and you combine it with instances in which you have G monolithic having a unique minimal non-trivial normal subgroup. And then in that situation for all but Q to the epsilon of these, um, of these fields K in our, in our, um, in our family, each of the art and L functions associated to these Galois groups, whose kernel does not contain N as a, as a subgroup, well, these art and L functions are holomorphic and non-vanishing in this region. Now, the big kahuna question, when do we get all of the hypotheses of, these cor of this corollary satisfied? Well, we've actually gone over two very important collections of examples. The previous corollary applies to uh, when n at least five, uh, you take G to be Sn and take N to be An. G is monolithic here. N is our, is our unique minimal non-trivial normal subgroup. And the index of N in G is two, which is a prime power. So, our previous corollary applies. And so now, basically what this is saying is that all the, um, all the uh, R to null functions associated to faithful representations of G, they are holomorphic and non-vanishing in the region I just gave. Moreover, if P is prime, G is a transitive subgroup of SP. And well, remember we, we showed earlier that, that such G are monolithic. 
you take this unique minimal non-trivial normal subgroup uh, to be N and in all of these transitive subgroups, G is either going to have prime power index or it's going to be, uh, or it's going to be solvable. And so in particular, the most important uh, uh, faithful representations that we're going to be looking at, well, you take a field F, a subset of K, and you assume that F intersects Kn is the rationals, that this intersection is trivial, then this zero free region is gonna trickle down to zeta F over zeta. And uh, in particular, uh, what this is telling us, I'm just giving you a, a, an example here in, in the degree P case. Um, uh, what this is doing for us is we now combine all the transitive subgroups of SP, put them all, put them all together. And we find that there is a lower bound for the um, total number of um, degree P fields F. Here, there's no Galois constraint of any sort. We're not assuming that these fields have any particular Galois group. We've lumped them all together. And there are at least Q to the half of these fields uh, with prime degree discriminant up to Q. And now, um, zeta F over zeta, that's going to be one of the faithful representations uh, of, this, uh, of this group G. And now all of these have good zero free regions, even though these extensions are not known to be Galois. No, no, I'm sorry. Even though these extensions are not Galois. So nothing quite like this has been available before without some sort of assumption of like art and holomorphy. So what can you do with these? Um, just because uh, I, I, I wasn't told whether this was an hour or a 50 minute seminar. So I'm just gonna go through one application. Oh, and then um, uh, clearly a similar result is going to hold for the degree on SN extensions. It's actually a bit easier because you just apply this corollary. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go through one application and if people are inclined to ask, I'll go through another. Um, this is just one more slide. Um, so. Here's a really classical application. Uh, take a number field F, let L at least two be an integer and let Delta be less than one over two L times a degree of F over Q minus one. If there exist M non-inert unramified prime ideals of F with norm at most DF to the Delta. So what this is asking for is a lot of really, really small non-inert unramified primes. Then the order of the class group uh, its L torsion part is bounded by um, basically the trivial Minkowski bound uh, discriminant to the half plus epsilon divided by M. And so if you can produce lots of small unramified uh, non-inert prime ideals, then this will go down. And in particular, um, if you assume Riemann hypothesis, then what you can do is you can, you can basically show that there are like df to the one over two L f over q minus one uh, minus epsilon prime ideals uh, non-inert with norm up to this threshold. And so you get a power savings over this trivial bound. And this was one of the motivating applications of the uh, aforementioned work of uh, Pierce, Turnage, Butterbaugh, and Wood. Um, their their, their um, zero density estimate on average is able to, uh, is able to show that you get uh, under certain hypotheses involving intersection multiplicity and also the uh, strong Artin conjecture, you're able to achieve lots of small, completely split primes which are going to be non-inert. They're as non-inert as you get. And thus you get a power savings here. And um, well, what we observe is that um, 
once you have a good zero free region for zeta k over zeta, basically the prime ideal theorem is going to get you um, uh, lots of these small non-inert primes. And what do we show? Well, we precisely show that zeta f over zeta in certain reasonable settings has this good zero free region. And so uh, for all except q to the epsilon of the degree p fields f with discriminant at most q, we have this. So this is a power savings over the trivial bound given to you by Minkowski of discriminant to the half. And a similar result is going to hold for all degree n SN extensions. Um, I can talk about more applications if people want, but uh, I, I don't know whether I went over time because I don't know if this was hour versus 50 minutes. So I'll just stop here. Thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, yeah, let's all thank Jesse. It, it was an hour talk, by the way. So you did. Okay. Um, yeah, in your in your last slide, the the constant out front in your your zero for your region, how far you can be away from one of p factorial squared in the denominator is pretty yeah. big. <laughs> that that grows pretty that that gets good pretty rapidly. Yeah, the idea here is that you think of p as being fixed. Mm -hmm. okay. um, with these sorts of averages, there is basically no way that you can get uniformity in P unless you're assuming something like a quasi Riemann hypothesis. Like, like here, my, my nice zero free region is going up to imaginary part of S is less than or equal to a power of the discriminant. Um, if you want uniformity in these degrees, you really need to assume like that the imaginary part of S is arbitrarily large. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you actually have here like an honest to God quasi Riemann hypothesis. And if you could, um, if you could prove that, then you can get some results with reasonably well-behaved dependence on the, um, on the degree. Asif and I have actually thought a lot about problems involving that that extra bit of uniformity, but if you want this sort of powerful averaging, you kind of, you kind of have to take the um, you kind of have to take the degree as being fixed. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. How sharp is the L torsion uh, L, uh, class group bound again? I mean, well, what do we expect on average again? Oh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, so. So GRH gives you this. And so we get a GRH quality result on average. I see. What do we expect to be true? Um, we expect that, that this is bounded by DF to the epsilon uh, with an implied constant depending on epsilon, L, and the degree of the field. Mm -hmm. So. It's kind of weird, like um, if you've thought at all about uh, subconvexity before, um, you have a trivial you, you have a trivial convexity bound, which is like um, for these Dedekind zeta functions, like you you want to bound them on the half line, for instance. Um, they're bounded by like discriminants of the one fourth at s equals a half. If you believe Riemann hypothesis, you get the Lindolf hypothesis. And they're bounded by like discriminant to the epsilon at the half line. And any savings at the half line over the one fourth usually yields like spectacular consequences. Hmm. Um, here, the quote unquote subconvexity bound is a consequence of Riemann hypothesis. The DF to the epsilon, we really don't have much of an idea of how to get there. That's, yeah. um, that's given to you by like probabilistic considerations. Yeah. Great. Other questions for Jesse? Uh, if not, Jesse, uh, we still have a little time if you want to give your other example. Oh, sure. Okay. So, um, so this example here, uh, this is talking about like L torsion and class groups, and we're getting reasonably good bounds on on them. Like, again, this is this is a consequence. This is the consequence that you get from like the Riemann hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So we also are able to consider um, uh, large class groups. So 
Uh, it's a theorem due to uh, Bill Duke um, from a while back, almost 20 years ago. Um, fix a signature N, uh, I'm gonna write that as R1 complex embeddings plus two times R2 complex embeddings. I assume this is at least two. There exist at least uh, some polynomial in Q many degree N fields whose Galois closure has Galois group SN. So full, full Galois closure, discriminant going up to Q such that the regulator of F, this is uh, the most pesky part of the class number formula, but here at the regulator, you have strong upper and lower bounds for it. And also you have um, O of log discriminant many primes that split completely in F. And when you combine these two things together, what you get is that not dealing with L torsion anymore, but the full class group uh, for, 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 for the fields that we're counting here, and there's a good number of them, polynomially many, um, discriminant to the half, this is the Minkowski bound, divided by log discriminant to the um, R1 plus R2 minus one. This is coming from our regulator component of the class number formula times the residue of Riemann zeta at S equals a half. And because you have that so many, um, so many small primes split completely, if you're willing to assume GR, uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis and the Artin conjecture, the residue is something that you can compute reasonably closely and the fact that we have so many primes that split completely, you get both upper and lower bounds on it. And it's this log log uh, DF to the R1 plus two R2 minus one. Okay, so th this family of fields is very special. Be uh, the hardest part of Duke's proof is the regulator bound. But then for good measure, you assume uh, GRH and Artin and you get this, you get these upper and lower bounds on the residue. And basically what this is telling you is that for these fields that he's counting, the class number is, is uh, provably as large as possible. If you're willing to assume GRH and Artin. And what Osif and I are able to do, uh, I'm sorry, Osif, Robert and I are able to do, because it's the new work. I was thinking about the old work, I'm sorry. Um, what we're able to show is that um, if you have a good zero free region for zeta f over zeta, but also remember um, in general, uh, right? These are degree n SN fields. These are not Galois unless n is two. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, don't have, you don't have that zeta f over zeta is holomorphic anymore. We, we expect it to be true, but it's not proven. And so, uh, and so this residue, right? You're very much using the holomorphy and the non-vanishing to, to get this good bound. But the holomorphy and the non-vanishing are consequences of my work with uh, Robert and Asif. And remember the size of our exceptional set is Q to the epsilon, which is smaller than this. Assuming you make epsilon sufficiently tiny. So what we're able to do is we're able to apply our work in this setting to show that for these fields, the ones that Duke counted, you actually get the GRH quality. Uh, um, so, 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 so an upper bound on the residue of this sort is very easy to prove. It's the lower bound on this residue that's tricky. And that's requiring the fact that in these fields, you have lots of small split primes. Um, so, so this upper bound is easy to show. It's the lower bound here that's, that's interesting, mm. right? This, because basically like, you know, th think like to Grenville Sound's paper on the distribution of L1 chi, these class numbers basically exhibit some sort of a distribution. And what Duke is showing is that infinitely often you hit the tail of that distribution, assuming GRH and Artin. And what, uh, Asif and Robert and I are able to show is that you can hit that tail infinitely often unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually have a few more applications, but uh, I don't want to go too far over time. So uh, um, I think 
I, I, have, I actually have a couple more on the slides, but I'll, I'll just uh, call it here unless people want to linger and talk extra. Great. Yeah, very nice. Um, any other questions for Jesse? Okay, well, if not, let's uh, thank Jesse again. Very nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, these are these are